this video is going to provide an overview of the theropod dinosaurs. Obviously, as I go through the videos in my playlist, if you were interested in any of these in particular, and then some of these videos then go through them in a greater amount of detail. Uh, so theropod dinosaurs, uh, we first have to mention the gentleman who named them. Othniel Charles Marsh. Uh, he discovered 80 species of dinosaurs and um, not full skeletons were known, especially uh, at first. And so a number of the groups that he named uh, were named for the feet that they had. So theropoda in Latin means beast feet, sauropoda means lizard feet, and ornithopoda means bird feet. Now, that is wonderful that, you know, this gentleman who made a great uh, contribution uh, to, you know, the understanding of dinosaurs and the groups of dinosaurs um, would pick out features where they vary. Uh, a problem obviously arises in that turns out these are huge groups that he did not know. And so, uh, for example, sauropods would include both bipedal so uh, prosauropods and the quadrupedal uh, sauropods. And thus naming dinosaurs uh, for the feet uh, then assumes that all members of the group would have uh, the same uh, feet. And so, for example, um, sauropods are named the lizard feet. But if you were to look at the feet of sauropods, um, they don't look particularly lizard-like. So it is a name. Um, may perhaps not the most uh, accurate of uh, names. Come on. So these sauropods, whether it be the sauropods or the prosauropods, if you were to look at the feet, they don't look particularly lizard-like. And so while it's a name, once again, uh, perhaps not the most accurate name. Uh, and then what I'm about to say, I don't, it isn't known for sure, but it's certainly guessed, that uh, while he did make an accurate observation when he referred to dinosaurs as bird feet, because some clearly did have three toes pointing forward and one uh, toe more rearward uh, facing, like birds. And when he called some beast feet, some actually had widened toes and actually could have hooves on the tips of their toes, like beasts. Um, did he, after naming them, forget which group was which? Because the ornithopods, whose name literally means bird feet, a lot of them then had widened toes, including Iguanodon, which was, you know, the earliest member of the group, which was uh, well understood. Um, and so, you know, these large, potentially hoof-bearing toes, if anything, they seem more like beast feet, and they were named, quote, the bird feet. Um, but then when you were to look at the meat-eating dinosaurs, uh, which are um, called theropods, which literally means beast feet, well, here lots of them then have rather bird-like looking feet. So if you were to look at the footprints of a dinosaur, or the footprints of a turkey, um, they would look a lot alike with three toes pointing forward. Um, and then there was, you know, one toe uh, pointing uh, backwards uh, in most. Um, and so it is possible that while he began with a very astute observation, say perhaps from partial ske uh, skeletal remains and then named a group, that perhaps later it was kind of confused which you know, fossils the name actually belonged to. And that by the time it was realized that this name didn't really seem to match the group very well, that there would be a reluctance to change it because by now Marsh was one of the early fossil hunters and, and legendary. And so if Marsh had established this name, then, you know, perhaps it would then uh, stick. Um, and so uh, we begin with the theropods, which literally means beast feet. They don't really have beast feet. So, uh, so we begin with an apology for the name. Um, when dinosaurs first appeared in the Triassic period, so there were no dinosaurs um, in the Paleozoic era, and there were no dinosaurs in the early Triassic period. But when dinosaurs appeared in the um, mid-Triassic, uh, the earliest ones which we have, and the majority of the ones in the Triassic, had a hip that looked like this, where the ischium projected backwards and the pubis bone uh, projects forwards. And that's kind of normal, and it was certainly like the dinosaur amorphs. Um, and the name which we give to that is lizard hip, all right, or saurician, ischium is one of the bones of the hip. So saurician um, uh, hips are lizard hips with the pubic bone projecting uh, forward. 
Now, um, the earliest dinosaurs looked like this, all right? They were small bipedal and they were saurischians. Um, but now from these, uh, then different lineages would uh, spread. And so then later dinosaurs, many of them, we continue to call saurischians, and they would include the meat-eating theropods and then the long-necked sauropods. And if you say, how is that possible? The sauropods look nothing like the meat-eating theropods. They did it first. They were bipedal prosauropods without much in the way of adaptations for um, for herbivory. Um, only later did they, you know, become quadrupedal and develop their long necks, etc. And so the saurischian groups include the um, meat-eating theropods and the sauropods, which include the early prosauropods and the later uh, sauropods. Uh, and we will split the theropods into groups in uh, just uh, a second. Now, this idea of the hip, it's nice to have this one clear defining feature, um, uh, you know, and say, oh, look at the hip, you know, and we can then classify uh, uh, dinosaurs. Um, but we should say, we shouldn't exaggerate. Uh, that because everything can, you know, change over time. So for example, tetrapods are defined for having four legs, um, but snakes lost their legs, um, whales lost their hind legs, as uh, worm lizards, most of them lost all of their legs, or at least, you know, their hind legs, one group still has their four legs. Um, some lizards have lost their legs. So you can call a group the tetrapods because most of them have the, the four legs. But then, it, you know, obviously some can modify this um, going forward. And so when you look at a dinosaur hip, one of the first things you should look at is the hip and the or, and then ask, you know, is the pubic bone projecting forwards? In which case I call it a saurischian dinosaur. Or has the pubic bone, which, you know, once projected this way, has it rotated? So now it's projecting backwards. In which case that's an ornithischian dinosaur um, or a bird hip. Now, once again, this is not perfect because some of the later theropods, including the closest relative birds, they actually rotate their, their pubic bone backwards. So while this saurischian hip is the feature of most saurischian dinosaurs, um, once again, things can change later in a group. Uh, and the last of the theropod uh, dinosaurs, uh, they then actually modified their hips so became bird-like. They were the ancestors of birds. Um, so this trait isn't perfect, but it's certainly a nice place to start. The first dinosaurs were small. They were you know, three to six feet long, they were bipedal, and they weren't very uh, specialized. From these early theropods would then evolve all of then the theropods, uh, which uh, existed then throughout the uh, Triassic uh, uh, period, uh, my, my, uh, throughout the uh, Mesozoic uh, era. Okay, so here's that ornithischian hip uh, looking uh, different. Um, now, in the old days, uh, when uh, theropods were then broken into subgroups, because we biologists, we do that just to understand stuff. So mammals are broken into rodents and carnivores and bats and whales. We just don't say mammals. Um, and then the carnivores are split into the cat half and the dog half. Um, Etc. So the same thing with the meat-eating dinosaurs. We just don't treat them as the meat-eating dinosaurs. You know, there'll be subdivisions and hopefully their classification represents real biological groupings where the members of one group are more closely related to each other than they are to any other group. Um, originally, a classification scheme was among these meat-eating dinosaurs. Let's classify them into the big ones and the little ones. So the big ones we'll put in a group called the carnosaurs. The little ones we'll put in a group called the silurosaurs. Um, but obviously, that doesn't work. I mean, when we consider mammals, um, there are big rodents, which are pig-sized. Some fossil ones were cow-sized. There are uh, little rodents. There are little primates that I can hold in my hand. Uh, then there are gorillas. And, and so size isn't you know, the best anatomical feature to classify things in. And so then that old classification scheme had to be uh, abandoned. We don't have two groups, the big ones and the little ones. And so a good place to start would be to say, all right, uh, in the Triassic, we have very early forms, the basal Triassic uh, theropods from which two lineages arise. The ceratosaurs, which were more common on southern continents, 
Um, this was the smaller of the two derived groups. And then the fused tails, the tetanorans, which made up most of those. And then in the tetanorans, we can subdivide that into a number of groups because of how big this group is. Um, and so I'd like to then uh, talk about the basal triassic theropods, uh, you know, one of our important uh, groups. And then later we'll talk about uh, the, um, the other members of uh, this group. Um, but just I, before I, I talk about the groups individually, perhaps just a few words about theropods in general. First off, they didn't all live together in the same time nor in the same part of the world. Now, um, so for example, you know, as a kid, grew up watching Flintstones. Um, the Flintstones depict all of the fossil life living together. Look, there's the dinosaur, there's the saber tooth, you know, cat, there's the cave person, you know, there's the pterodactyl. They're all living together. Um, but that's just not the way uh, it happened. When we talk about humans in the past, right, just because the Egyptian pharaohs were in the past and Napoleon was in the past and Genghis Khan was in the past and George Washington was in the past, doesn't mean they all lived together nor does it mean that they all lived in the same part of the world. The world's a big place. And so therefore, here's the Mesozoic era. All right? It starts at the end of that end Permian extinction, the worst extinction in Earth's history. Um, so the Triassic period begins about 250 million years ago. And the Cretaceous period ends in perhaps the second worst extinction in the past 500 million years. So this Mesozoic era is bounded by two mass extinctions, one at the beginning, one at the end. There's another one of the big five mass extinctions at the end of the Triassic. We'll talk about that um, uh, later. Um, and so therefore, this is a long uh, period uh, of a time. You know, we're, you know, 180 million years all right, the dinosaurs are actually from the mid-Triassic, so perhaps a little less than that. But that's a long time. And just like Genghis Khan and George Washington and the Egyptian pharaohs didn't live together, there were dinosaurs which were only known in the Triassic. They evolved here and then they went extinct here. There were dinosaurs which were only known in the Jurassic. They evolved there and then they went extinct there. Um, there were dinosaurs which are only known in the uh, Cretaceous. They evolved then and they went extinct then. Um, so, for example, when we think of meat-eating dinosaurs, a lot of people will think of Tyrannosaurus rex. Well, fine, um, but almost no dinosaur ever saw a Tyrannosaurus rex. Why? Because Tyrannosaurus rex lived only in the last five million years of the Cretaceous. T. rex missed most of the age of dinosaurs, and it was only known from Western North uh, America. Uh, I have here maps because, as other videos will talk about, um, the continents were moving. In the Triassic, they um, had fused a, um, to, to make Pangaea. Um, but then at the end, Triassic extinction, one of the things that began to happen was that the Atlantic Ocean began to separate the northern and uh, southern uh, continents. And so um, a dinosaur's ability to spread throughout the world varied. It's easier when all of the continents are fused versus when they start uh, to separate. And so one of the important things to keep in mind is that when we think of a meat-eating dinosaur, uh, the world's a big place and 180 million years is a really long period of time. And so therefore, each dinosaur is known from specific points in time and from specific parts of the world, all right? And so when we ask, you know, um, why were there, you know, big meat-eating dinosaurs? Uh, well, T-Rex was a huge meat-eating dinosaur uh, in North America, and not all parts of North America, only this western part. So there was a, an inland sea in the Cretaceous, and uh, T-Rex only lived in the western part called Laramidia in the last five million years. Um, but then there were only, then there were uh, meat-eating dinosaurs known from India. There were uh, meat-eating dinosaurs known from Antarctica, uh, or from Australia, or from Asia, Europe, South America, uh, etc. And so as we consider this, just like wildlife today, uh, there's wildlife uh, unique to different parts of uh, the world. And because of the great length of the Mesozoic era, then dinosaurs uh, did not all live uh, together. So uh, they live in, um, in different parts of, uh, of the world and at different times. So that's an important um, Uh, so that's an important uh, 
uh, thought, and I go through that uh, in a couple of uh, videos. Uh, and so uh, this next video, once again, so if I had some representations of theropods, uh, you could say this is a Triassic theropod, this is a Jurassic uh, theropod, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, so here we have a whole bunch of theropods. They never met each other. Right? Just because they all lived in the age of dinosaurs didn't mean you know, they all you know, lived at the same uh, time. All right? And so some would have been specific to the Triassic, to the Jurassic, to uh, the Cretaceous, uh, et, et cetera. A few other uh, thoughts about uh, theropods. Okay, so once again, they're unique to different parts of the world. Okay. Um, so they're related to each other. So theropod dinosaurs are more closely related to each other than they are to any other group of uh, dinosaurs. Um, but just like mammals form a group, and within that, primates form a group, and within that, the apes form a group, and within that, humans form a group. So even though they're related, they're not related to each other equally. There are subgroups here, and we could depict that using what's called a cladogram. Well, the same thing here with the uh, dinosaurs. It was a great family tree, which slowly evolved. So there would be early branches. There would be later branches of this family uh, tree. And so thus, uh, some theropods were uh, much more closely related to uh, another group than they were to some other group. So the basal Triassic theropods, that would be the first branch off this family tree. And then so then other, you know, primitive lineages like Coelophysis and the Ceratosaurs, they would branch off early. So things like T-Rex were not very closely related to the Ceratosaurs because that was um, a much earlier um, branch. So I just, we don't have to spend time on it, but just two quick points. One is that there are rules, all right? You just can't say a dinosaur is a theropod just because. You can't say it's a Silurosaur or an Avetheropodon, um, et cetera. You just can't say if there are rules. So you can say, all right, if you're going to define a group, what features define the group? And you say, oh, well, members of this group have this kind of hip, this change in this metatarsal bone, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and so for it, it's not, you know, eyeballing, ah, put it in this group of dinosaurs. Um, just like, you know, there are features that mammals have and features that rodents have. There are features that uh, the tetanorans have. There are features that the avetheropodans have, et cetera. And one of the reasons to uh, consider this, not that, you know, I'm going to emphasize it here, is because once we construct this family tree, um, it's a bit surprising at who occupies this very last node. It's the birds. So birds have descended from theropod dinosaurs. They're in the family tree. And the traits which evolve here at this point are shared by everyone above that node, including the first birds. The traits which evolve at this point are shared by you know, the ones uh, above it in the family tree, including the first um, birds. So in a later lecture, when I talk about the evolution of birds, this family tree becomes very important. Birds are descended from theropod dinosaurs and over the family tree of theropod dinosaurs. We see avian traits developing slowly. Um, so it's not that surprising that in a big group over a long period of time that they have some variations in their teeth. Now in general, these are meat-eating dinosaurs. Um, now we're assuming that uh, because very few of them have gut contents or you know proof of their predation. So for example, there was a T-Rex bite mark on a Triceratops hip. So in that instance, we can say, you know what? I think T-Rex preyed on Triceratops. Um, uh, Sinosauropteryx, a feathered theropod, had a mammal in its gut in one fossil. So you can say at that point, ah, you know, here's one that ate mammals. Uh, Spinosaurus, one had a big fish in its gut. Um, another one had, I, I believe, uh, Baryonyx had um, remains of a pterosaur in its gut. Uh, so there are a couple of, uh, Compsognathus had a lizard in its gut. Um, there are a couple of examples where the fossil includes undigested uh, prey items. And you can say with then certainty, you know, this you know, thing ate that thing, but that's rare. And so therefore then we are stuck with, um, well, let's guess at what these things might have eaten um, based on, I don't know, their teeth. Now, when you look at, for example, the, the um, T. 
teeth of T. rex. Those are not teeth for eating plants. They would be absolutely horrible at attempting to you know, strip uh, plant leaves. They're serrated on the edges, just like a meat you know, cutting knife would be uh, uh, serrated on the edges. And so with T. rex, it is probably a good bet that um, a T. rex ate meat because those teeth really would not be adapted to eating anything other than uh, meat. That being said, we should be really careful um, because uh, it's easy to assume too much uh, with teeth. So for example, bears, let's take bears. Bears all have about the same kinds of teeth, but there are bears which eat pretty much just meat, polar bears. There are bears which pretty much eat just plants like bamboo, the panda bears. And then there's other bears which are in, including large amounts of ants or berries in their diet. Um, but they all have about the same teeth. And so the moral of that story is you can't accurately predict what a bear eats based on its uh, teeth. Bears which have the same teeth can have different diets. Same thing with apes. A chimp, uh, chimp teeth is about the same as gorilla teeth. Gorillas are vegetarians. Chimps eat a lot of raw monkey. And so by the teeth, you can't say, I know what um, uh, you uh, eat. Um, you can do that uh, a little bit when you look at the like gray foxes. Uh, they do, uh, they are a bit more omnivorous, including buried things in the diet uh, than other foxes. And you know, their teeth do reflect that uh, a little bit. So teeth give you an idea of what an animal might uh, have uh, eaten, um, but it shouldn't be the last word, nor should we say, you know, I now absolutely know. Uh, what things uh, eat based on uh, their uh, teeth. In addition, as the uh, theropods diversified, some of them had blunter teeth. Heck, some of them had no teeth. All right, so Oviraptor and many like Gallimimus, they had no teeth. Could you have no teeth and be a predator? Well, obviously, bald eagles are predators and they have no teeth, as are all hawks and eagles. Snapping turtles are predators, so you don't have to have teeth to be a predator. But then the question could legitim legitimately be raised, then how do we know what these things ate? And the answer is, we just don't. So we don't know what they ate for sure. So the theropods, um, I think the safest thing to say is, it seems that um, all of the meat-eating dinosaurs that we know of, or at least the major meat-eating dinosaurs, fit in this group. So the meat-eating dinosaurs were theropods. But is this a guarantee that every theropod dinosaur ate meat or ate only meat? No, especially if they don't have teeth or they have blunter teeth, there's certainly the possibility that then their diet is more diversified. Um, certainly today, I mean, when you think of raccoons or opossums, um, there are certainly uh, predators uh, which can include a lot of material, so some animal material, some plant uh, material uh, as well. And, and so uh, we don't absolutely know dinosaur diets. Uh, we don't absolutely know which group did which. But nevertheless, the theropods in general include the meat-eating dinosaurs. And in general, there's no evidence that there's another dinosaur that was adapted for predation, which is outside this group. So if we refer to these as the meat-eating uh, dinosaurs, you know, I, I believe that would be safe uh, enough. Um, uh, so the very first uh, theropods, the basal Triassic theropods, um, perhaps Eoraptor is a, a good uh, choice. Um, actually, this is, it's annoying that we can't say things with absolute certainty, but this is perhaps then the point, in that um, these three that I'm going to mention, Eoraptor, Herrerasaurus, and Staurichosaurus, are they definitely theropods? Um, and there has been some debate on that, even some debate on whether we should consider them as dinosaurs or the sister of dinosaurs. But the reason for this is these are the most primitive theropods. So all theropods after the basal Triassic uh, forms share features that the first forms uh, lack. And so if you wanted to argue, you know, maybe Eoraptor shouldn't even be within the theropod group. Maybe it should be an ancestral dinosaur, ancestral to both the theropods and non-theropods. And some have said, look, if we look at the teeth, there even seem to be different kinds of teeth. Some of them look like 
theropod meat-eating teeth, but some of them remind us of uh, the sauropods, which ate plants. And so if your raptor was you know, one of the earliest dinosaurs, the fact that it hadn't yet become a meat-eating theropod or a plant-eating sauropod, and maybe a teeth for both, maybe that's you know, even better evidence of its early transitional uh, uh, form. Uh, so Eoraptor is a very primitive uh, dinosaur. Astaurichosaurus, um, uh, also small bipedal. Herrerasaurus, uh, different forms, some were a bit uh, larger. Um, but then all of these are primitive uh, theropods from uh, the uh, Triassic, more basal forms. Uh, one of the neat stories I like to tell my, my students is the name Herrerasaurus um, is named after the gentleman who found them. Uh, Victorino Herrera, if I recall. Uh, and you might ask, well, was he a, a paleontologist? The answer was no, he was a goat farmer who just happened to be walking his goats and looked down and found a dinosaur skeleton. And I say that because many individuals who have found, you know, many great discoveries of bones have not been uh, performed by, you know, experts who are digging and studying for them, but by just people who got lucky. Mary Anning discovered you know, an, an amazing uh, marine uh, reptile fossil when she was a little girl. Uh, and so for any one of us, it would be hard for one of us to make a great contribution to astrophysics or to molecular genetics, because you need a lab and you need training. But any of us could actually find a really cool fossil on, you know, on vacation or, you know, or somewhere just by luck. So I just throw that out there that, you know, you could um, be a, uh, you know, make a great paleontological uh, discovery if you just happen to be lucky. So um, as we go along, we will see that theropods certainly vary in size. You know, there were, um, you know, some which were, you know, 40 feet long. There are some which you could hold in the palm of your hand. Uh, and even in the basal um, Triassic theropods, you know, Eoraptor would have been the smallest, maybe a meter in length. Stargosaurus approaching double that size. Herrerasaurus even bigger. Um, and so there are a lot of things to eat in this world. When you think about cats, um, house cats can prey on items, lions can prey on items, but they're not preying on the same items, all right? And so since there's lots of things to eat, obviously, you know, you can have predators which are uh, different uh, sizes, uh, which can uh, take advantage of these uh, different uh, groups. From the basal theropods, uh, then a number of lineages uh, uh, separate. Some would be called the ceratosaurs. And now with Classifying animals in the family trees, there can sometimes be some um, variation. And so, for example, Coelophysis was originally considered to be a ceratosaur. Now, last I checked, the consensus was that it was a sister group of the, um, uh, the ceratosaurs. Um, this video and the others like it are attempting to just show that um, over millions of years, it would just be, say, minor changes which would be needed to transform the skull of say one of these forms into another. And so if you start off with say Eoraptor, a basal Triassic form and give it you know tens of millions of years, then you know getting a more elongate structure can obviously give us the skull of Coelophysis. So you know no major modifications were required. Um, you'll notice the big opening. So this opening is for the eye, that's for the nose. The uh, temporal openings, which would allow muscles from the lower jaw uh, to attach for a stronger bite, those are here, the upper and lower temporal openings. Um, the archosaurs then also evolved an opening in front of uh, the eye called the antorbital opening. And among other things, um, this would probably make the skull much lighter. Um, theropods, many of them, had rather large heads. Now, the bigger your head, the heavier it is. So that's certainly an issue. But theropods didn't walk like me, right? So if I had a he big head, like it would weigh down on me this way. Theropods ran this way, and we'll get back to that. That would have made them uh, top heavy. And some theropods, as we'll see, reduce the size of uh, their arms, uh, you know, perhaps as a counterbalance. Um, uh, but you can see that many uh, theropods uh, lighten the skull by these openings, which, you know, gave them a big, you know, skull, but it wasn't solid bone uh, as uh, well. Um, so Coelophysis is an early lineage of, uh, of dinosaur from the Triassic. 
And then one group, the ceratosaurs, uh, includes a number which have some form of head ornamentation. So for example, Dilophosaurus evolved this um, crest on its uh, head. Um, another uh, form, Ceratosaurus, for which uh, this group was named, had a nasal horn. And so while a little of this can occur in you know, all theropod uh, groups, the Ceratosaurus, um, uh, they had a bit more in the, um, once again, in the way of head ornamentation. Um, you know, just a point, as I mentioned that there are these groups like the ceratosaurs, uh, this isn't a random thing. Uh, once again, there are rules. So for example, uh, ceratosaurs are different from tetanurans. Here's an example where if you look at the uh, hip bone uh, in the tetanurans, the tip of the pubic bone will expand to form what's called a pubic boot. While in ceratosaurs, you see clearly that is not uh, the case. Um, obviously, there can be variation within the group. So here you can see two uh, members have some fusion of uh, bones, uh, while uh, others, uh, uh, the bones uh, of the hip were separate. Um, and so uh, dinosaurs start off with five fingers, um, but then some of the fingers were gradually reduced. So Ceratosaurus still had four, um, but a lot of the dinosaurs uh, would gradually reduce their um, hands uh, to being three-fingered uh, hands. And here you can see Syntarsis, um, uh, relative of uh, Coelophysis, uh, where one digit didn't even say leave the, um, it didn't break uh, the palm. A Dilophosaurus was known for uh, those uh, pair of uh, fragile ridges on uh, its head. Um, and uh, we don't know what they were uh, for, they would have been, say, too fragile to use in, say, combat or fighting. Um, so we can only guess. And one of the things that we could guess is that, uh, just like, say, ducks on a pond today, in mating season, um, how do the females know which male uh, to mate with? How do they know who belongs to their group? Um, well, visually, you know, because some females know the males in my group have the green head or the long tail feathers or whatever. And if there was different, you know, head ornamentation, perhaps that then helped, you know, these um, uh, theropods then identify what group they belong to. So one of the ones from South America, for uh, my fault, from Antarctica, uh, also had a... Uh, a prominent ridge. Uh, ceratosaurs had a nasal uh, horn. There were different species of ceratosaurs which could have um, you know, horns to different uh, degrees. Now, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the, the things just to point out, I know it's fun to say, you know, this one is the biggest meat-eating dinosaur of all time. This one is the smallest meat-eating dinosaur of all time. But obviously, we can never really say that. All we can say is, this is the largest one which has been discovered to date. This is the smallest one which has been discovered to date. You know, next year, a new theropod dinosaur might be discovered. For a while, Ceratosaurus was the largest known meat-eating dinosaur before Tyrannosaurus. And now, as we'll see, there are um, a number of large um, uh, uh, there are a number of large uh, dinosaurs uh, which would rival uh, uh, tyrannosaurs. Um, uh, in this group, uh, there were uh, some like Carnotaurus, uh, sometimes referred to as the Zinnibull, with these expressions on its head. Um, Carnotaurus was like T. Rex in this one, uh, that had small arms. It also had a really thick head. And those two apparently well, in a different way than that. You know, our body faces uh, and so it's a large head that makes you top heavy. And so as a result, uh, perhaps uh, the way that you could balance then being so top heavy uh, is that uh, you would make uh, your arms much smaller. So if you have this thick head, maybe arms are, are less necessary. And just if you had big hands and big arms at the same time, that would make you top heavy to the point where you were, you know, potentially continue uh, uh, capable of, you know, falling frequently. So from these base thereupon evolved of uh, lineages. One we call the ceratosaurs, you know, some form of ornamentation, uh, and uh, were particularly common on the more southern continents. Uh, while a second group then became part of the group of so once again, uh, if the theropods represent a family tree, you know, the basal theropods, Coelophysis, ceratosaurs, they could be early branches, but then there would be a number of new traits which evolved in the tetanor tetanorans 
and everyone above this node excuse me, would be called uh, tetanorans, which we could then uh, subdivide into uh, different groups. And it's, you know, as uh, later when we ask uh, where did uh, birds uh, come from, um, birds are tetanorans. And so many of the traits which would define the birds, you know, there's this semicircular wrist bone, for example, an expansion of more uh, bones which have spaces in the bones for air sacs, um, for the avian style of uh, breathing. You know, some of these avian features would evolve in the early tetanorans. Now, um, many tetanorans, especially early branches of tetanorans, tended to be large uh, animals. Uh, getting us then to the question, who's the biggest dinosaur of all time? Well, allosaurs could get to be big and there's, you know, uh, while somewhere, you know, maybe 20 to 30 some feet long, uh, one specimen, you know, was arguably uh, uh, bigger than that. Uh, Gigantosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, Acropanthosaurus, they were all about the size of T-Rex. So for a while, Tyrannosaurus rex was, you know, undisputed the largest known theropod dinosaur. And now there are a number which seem to be about the same size, um, including a, a number of these early lineages of uh, Tetanorans. Once again, the world's a big place. And if you have a big place, just like you can have tigers living in Asia and lions living in Africa and jaguars living in South America and pumas in North America and a little South America. Um, so if the world's a big place, you can have big cats living on different continents that aren't competing with each other. Um, then some of these meat-eating dinosaurs, some lived in different parts of the uh, world as some lived at uh, different times. Now, I know in, you know, to some degree you would want to say, oh, you know, this one was the biggest, so therefore clearly the fiercest, like T-Rex. Um, but once again, I, you know, maybe we could look at it in different ways. Uh, T-Rex lived in a narrow period of time, the last five million years of the Mesozoic, only in Western North America. Um, nowhere else. So most dinosaurs never saw a T-Rex. They didn't live at the right time or in the right place. Allosaurus was smaller than T-Rex, even though there is a, a specimen which is pretty big. Um, uh, and so uh, Allosaurus, uh, you know, wasn't, you know, quite, you know, as big in, in size, um, but nevertheless, they seem to have hunted in packs. There are accumulations of bones, there are footprints which suggest perhaps they hunted in packs. And so even if one Allosaur wasn't as large as one Tyrannosaur, if there was a group of them, well, that might have changed things uh, considerably. And Allosaurus was capable of spreading throughout the world. Allosaurus is known from, from uh, North America, uh, from Australia and Antarctica, from the islands of uh, Europe. And so, uh, and it lived during the Jurassic uh, period, you know, for tens and tens of millions of years. And so even though Allosaurus wasn't the largest of the predatory dinosaurs, perhaps more than any other predatory dinosaur, it was the one taking lives of other uh, dinosaurs. So, you know, in that sense, perhaps it was the most fierce of, um, of uh, that uh, group. Uh, once again, just to return quickly to that, you know, idea of uh, size. So, uh, Allosaurus, uh, some specimens were larger than others. Um, it's a tetanoran. And as I had said, you know, we don't name these things randomly. And so we could say, oh, look at these features, the, you know, the pubic boot, the semicircular wrist bone, the process on the ankle bone, um, and that uh, these are uh, features of uh, the uh, tetanorans. Uh, like I'd said, uh, many of the tetanorans uh, were large, including the megalosaurus. And if you recall, uh, this was one where some finds were discovered in the 1600s, even though they weren't uh, well uh, understood at uh, the time. Uh, uh, this uh, group spread all throughout uh, uh, the world and included a, a number of you know, uh, lineages. Um, Baryonyx seems to have been more of a fish-eating dinosaur. Its snout is narrow uh, the way that uh, you know, many animals like some crocodiles have narrowed their snout to make them better at hunting fish. And there was a large thumb claw once again, perhaps an adaptation for eating fish, and that uh, one baryonyx had a, uh, a fish uh, in uh, its gut. Um, Spinosaurus was a uh, large um, 
uh, dinosaur, um, which out of all of the ones which were about the size of uh, T. rex, um, spinosaurus actually might have been bigger than T. rex just hands down. And so uh, if we were asking who is the biggest uh, theropod of all time, spinosaurus is perhaps that one. And obviously an interesting uh, question would be, you know, what then is the cause of this sale? Um, because some dinosaurs had low sails. A sail would just be lengthened thoracic vertebrae. So some dinosaurs had, you know, some moderate um, lengthening of uh, their vertebrae. Uh, some uh, had uh, more, like uh, Acrocanthosaurus would have had a low sail, and Spinosaurus would have had uh, a much more prominent sail. Why? Uh, well, once again, if there's a value in identifying who belongs to your group or not, you know, here's a way of, of doing that. Um, but also we think that if you were trying to regulate your body's temperature, um, if you turned your sail towards the sun, you would warm up faster. On a hot day, if you were facing, uh, facing the sun, so this didn't hit you broadside and there was a wind blowing, you would cool down faster. So maybe, you know, the, the value was uh, in thermoregulation. That being said, there's uh, a bunch of dinosaurs which are about the size of Tyrannosaurus uh, rex. Uh, once again, not that surprising because, for example, Gigantosaurus lived in South America. Carcharodontosaurus and Spinosaurus lived in Africa. The world's a big place, so you can have different big dinosaurs living in different, um, at different areas uh, and then also living at different times. Well, who is absolutely the biggest? Well, I don't know, let's not get into that because, for example, with this one, the skull is well known, but not really the rest of uh, the body. Um, in uh, many cases, you have, say, partial skeletons. And so you estimate the body size of, you know, the animal based on some but not all of, um, uh, of the bones. Uh, and so, you know, you have an estimation. And then also, many dinosaurs are known uh, their species only by a couple of individuals. And just like if you were to think of dogs, you know, uh, there are certainly really big dogs. And if you saw an average sized dog or two or three, that might not give you, you know, a uh, complete idea of um, uh, what the largest dog size could be. And so if we only have a couple of representatives, you know, we, we don't certainly know what is the maximum size a species could attain. Within the Tetanorans, uh, most lineages would, uh, after the first lineages, which were primarily large, um, uh, lots of smaller Tetanorans uh, evolved. Um, uh, in, that would include the early uh, Tyrannosaurs. So even though Tyrannosaurus rex is best uh, known, a lot of the, uh, the earliest Tyrannosaurs were our size, you know, maybe uh, uh, six uh, feet long, uh, much uh, much uh, smaller. Um, so the lineage which would lead to T-Rex included, uh, you know, these small forms, larger forms like Albertosaurus, and then Tyrannosaurus. And as you uh, watch this video, a couple of things. One, uh, you know, it was just modifications of the ancestral heads which would lead to these new lineages. But Tyrannosaurus certainly had a larger than normal head. So Carnotaurus had a big head, um, Tyrannosaurus had a big head. And in these lineages, which had large heads, we then also see that the arms then become reduced. Once again, quite possibly as a counter uh, balance. So you can't have a big head and big arms at the same time, or else you would just be too uh, top heavy. Now, the arms certainly had muscles to them. So maybe they had some role in grabbing prey and securing it. Maybe an animal which was lying down or sleeping could roll over and this uh, could then have a role in uh, boosting um, the, uh, you know, the body up. Um, but certainly uh, uh, they could not reach the mouth and would have been uh, not effective in feeding in general. Um, while they had two fingers which broke the palm and some tyrannosaurs, there is still the, the splint of a bone uh, for the third uh, metacarpal, so the remains of the third finger which the smaller ancestral tyrannosaurs had. Um, and this is uh, uh, present in uh, some uh, forms. Okay. 
Um, within the tetanurans, we could start now making smaller and smaller groups, like we could call one group the Ave Theropodans, and then a subgroup of that the Silurosaurs, the Tyranoraptora, the Maniraptora forms, the Maniraptorans. So once again, um, just like in modern groups, we have a family or a superfamily or a suborder or an order, we have a variety of different groups. Here we can see, uh, you know, that uh, uh, these theropods were not all equally related. We can see groups uh, within them. Uh, many of them start to become more and more bird-like, which I'll get back to. Uh, some of these uh, groups would lose their teeth. So things like Gallimimus and Ornithomimus had no teeth. Pelicanomimus actually had about 200 small teeth. And so this group is interesting because not only did it have a number of toothless forms, it also included uh, one form with more teeth than any other uh, theropod dinosaurs. Um, uh, these uh, perhaps had a more omnivorous uh, diet and certainly their, um, uh, their body uh, shapes uh, are reminding us more and more like birds, hence their name. So, so many of them are ornithomimus, you know, the bird mimic, or gallimimus, the chicken mimic. Um, and that's simply a, uh, a reference to the fact that the people who discovered their skeletons, you know, were of the mind, hey, these, these skeletons look an awful lot like the skeletons of birds. Uh, once again, as we go along, you know, we can find more and more uh, groups. Uh, a lot of the groups uh, contain primarily small uh, theropod dinosaurs. Just like today, uh, there are carnivores which eat small things. Weasels are carnivores, but they eat small prey. Um, mink are uh, small uh, carnivores. So there's lots of things that you can eat. You can eat fish, you can eat eggs, you can eat lizards, you can eat mammals. Um, and certainly a lot of the um, uh, uh, the many raptor and dinosaurs uh, were small feeding on small uh, items. You know, Ornitholestes had a nasal horn. Uh, this one had modified hands so that it only had one uh, digit uh, on the hand. Uh, a number of them were originally thought to be flightless birds. So that's kind of a, a, a thing I'll mention again in a second. As we get up this family tree, they're becoming more and more like birds. Not only do some of them have feathers, like a, you know, a downy feather to keep warm. Some of them will actually have flight uh, feathers. Some of them have bird-like traits, like brooding over the nest. And some of them just anatomically, they were originally thought to be birds. Um, and so as we go up this family tree, uh, we're getting uh, into uh, lineages which remind us more and more of uh, birds. Now that's a very important point, um, but one which I will leave um, you know, to a greater degree for uh, the separate uh, you know, video which I have on the origin of birds. So I'll mention it a little here, but get into it in uh, greater uh, detail uh, later. Uh, and so once again, as we go through here, we have um, lots of different uh, dinosaur groups, some with feathers, Sinosauropteryx being the first one to be known to be covered with a downy covering. Compsognathus was of interest um, because for a long time it was the smallest known um, a dinosaur. Um, but once again, just like the largest known dinosaur is something which will continually change as more dinosaurs are discovered, the same thing can be said of uh, Compsognathus. There have been smaller ones like Microraptor discovered earlier. Um, and as I said, I, I know that, for example, Tyrannosaurus is very big, uh, Utah Raptor is very big, but most of the members at the top of the theropod family tree are smaller. So before there were big Tyrannosaurs, there were much smaller Tyrannosaurs. DeLong was feathered and was about you know, our uh, size. Um, and so not all theropods, once again, uh, were uh, big. Now, I mentioned that dinosaurs uh, had uh, feathers. Uh, this is a topic which I'll get into once again more with birds. Um, while we often associate uh, feathers with flight, obviously some are very important for that, feathers do lots of things. Uh, they keep birds warm and being warm-blooded or endothermic is important for birds. It allows many to camouflage, so it's hard to see a green parrot in a tree or a, a brown uh, uh, parrot or a brown sparrow in a bush. And here you see, you know, the white feathers on, you know, eagles, uh, etc. Some might be reflecting light. Many are just to help identify groups. Uh, so, for example, you know what group a bird belongs into by its 
feathers. The age of the eagle is evident because bald eagles don't develop the white until they become mature. All right, so maybe they could help camouflage. You'll notice as the background changes, you know, which of these uh, would be harder to see uh, than uh, berries. And so feathers uh, don't have to function only in flight. They could function in courtship and other things. And the uh, dinosaurs, which had feathers at first, would not have been capable of flight. And so dinosaur uh, feathers, and feathers at first seem to just be elongated, uh, fluffy scales, um, and they seem to have originally served some function other than, uh, than flight. Even when flight feathers are known, there are dinosaurs with flight feathers. Not all of them could fly. Why did they have flight feathers if they couldn't fly? Well, we don't know. Once again, courtship's always an option, but you'd hate to just keep saying that because that could always be true of almost anything. Um, but one of the things is a lot of these uh, dinosaurs, um, they might have wanted the ability to jump on prey and to glide a bit. So for example, when you think of things like Velociraptor and Deinonychus, they had claws on their feet, switchblade claws, so obviously their feet were being used as a weapon. If you're using your feet as your weapon, does that mean that you're jumping in midair? And if you are, the ability to glide or steer in midair would probably um, be important. And so flight feathers um, uh, could then be uh, really uh, important, um, even if you're not flying. So as I will discuss in uh, the separate video where I focus more on say the flight feathers and, uh, and birds, um, there have actually been uh, feathers discovered in amber, which seem to be proto feathers in dinosaurs. Um, now feathers seem to have evolved from scales. And we say that because you know, they develop from the same types of buds in the embryo. And animals either have, um, uh, feathers or scales, uh, they don't have both. So say a chicken can have scales on its legs or feathers on its upper body, and the embryonic buds from which feathers and scales uh, develop uh, look uh, similar. And there are actually some proto-feather structures which seem to be the, um, uh, the, uh, the proto-feathers which covered uh, the bodies of some dinosaurs, uh, which have been uh, discovered in uh, amber. And so we actually have you know, the, the proto-feathers uh, which uh, covered some dinosaurs, um, and then even later ones uh, then had uh, flight feathers as well. Um, so these proto-feathers, these are not the complex flight feathers at first. And so just as one would expect, it seems that uh, feathers evolved over stages and that uh, there were feathers uh, which were, say, simply elongated scales long before they had been adapted to other roles. As well. So as we these are dinosaurs, uh, you know, getting to the, the last part of the family tree. But once again, in addition to being like, you know, a tyrannosaur, uh, I'm very, uh, most smaller. Um, some have feathers, even some tyrannosaurs have feathers, possibly uh, a tyrannosaurus rex uh, had, um, had uh, feathers. Um, it was once thought that this one didn't have feathers, um, but then uh, some were discovered on uh, the, uh, the tails uh, of, um, of Juravenator. Um, as we get into some of the uh, group once thought to be uh, called Cygnosaurs, as some of these uh, had feathers. Interestingly, as even though these are all Saurischian dinosaurs, and I know we think that that means the pubic bone points forwards, um, some of these now start to have a pubic bone going in the opposite direction, which is like birds. Oviraptor is one of two theropod dinosaurs, which has been found brooding over uh, a nest. This is a bird-like um, uh, uh, feature. Uh, and so uh, not only are we seeing anatomical similarities to birds, um, but also then uh, behavioral traits like birds. Uh, a couple of dinosaurs like Avamimus and Velociraptor, even though we don't have a fossil which preserves feathers, um, there do seem to be these dimples on the bones, which would be the places where feathers uh, attached. And so uh, if you were to look at birds today, the flight feathers, you know, they can attach to bone and you can see the spots of the bones where they did. And so even if the feathers aren't uh, present, you can see where feathers would have attached. Like I said, some of the theropod dinosaurs 
in addition to having you know, a downy covering of feathers then had flight feathers as well. And this would be more and more common as we start to get into the group which was most closely related to birds. So th uh, animals like Deinonychus and Velociraptor are you know, cousins of birds. Uh, once again, notice their pubic bone is going backwards. So even though they're, they're saurischians, uh, in birds, the pubic bone goes backwards. And in the theropod dinosaurs, most closely related to birds, the pubic bone goes backwards. Notice the switchblade claw on uh, the feet of some forms like Deinonychus and Velociraptor. Once again, if you're hunting with your feet, then perhaps uh, even if you're unable to fly, the possession of flight feathers, which Velociraptor had, um, as did the uh, early member of this group, uh, Synornithosaurus, an ancestor of things like Velociraptor. Um, uh, uh, we know that it had uh, uh, feathers um, uh, and perhaps the ability to glide was important. Also, if you were to look at this hand, the hands in this group, they were getting longer, and also the shoulder was modified so that this animal could hold its arm in the same way that birds would hold their wings. So as we go through this group, the hips are becoming more and more like birds, the pubic bone becoming uh, uh, retroverted, the uh, ischium becoming different, the behavior, you know, the brooding over the uh, nest is becoming more and more like uh, birds. Uh, some of these, I might have missed that slide, I'm sorry. Uh, some of these dinosaurs had fused collarbones, um, uh, a furcula. So just like um, uh, turkeys have wishbones, that's what's called a furcula, the two collarbones are fused. Um, some of the dinosaurs had a furcula as uh, well. Um, they started to develop flight uh, feathers. Now, some not only had them on their arms, uh, but also on uh, their legs. So Microraptor could have been held in the palm of your hand and with flight feathers on its uh, arms and legs, certainly would have been able uh, to at least glide and potentially fly. One is so well known uh, that the color of the feathers are actually known. So it was black, white with a little rufous uh, crest on, the, uh, on uh, the ridge. Rahona was once thought to be a bird, all right, but is now known to be a dinosaur. And if you look at the length of its hands, its flight feathers, Rahona you know, possibly would have been able to fly. So I know that sounds odd because, you know, dinosaurs had hands, birds have wings, but when you consider, you know, the arm and hand of Velociraptor or the arm and hand of Archaeopteryx, they are composed of the same uh, bones. Uh, the bird hand would have been slightly larger, all right, um, but nevertheless, uh, it's, um, sorry, it is hard to tell uh, the difference uh, between uh, the hand of some of these dinosaurs and the wings of birds. And so then just a few words to, to sum up. The meat-eating dinosaurs we put together in the group theropods, uh, and they're, they're fascinating. Um, I know, you know, the original idea of dinosaurs was, you know, perhaps like a dumb lizard type of thing, um, but obviously this doesn't apply to theropods. Uh, their brain sizes were certainly within bird range, making sense of birds evolved from them, um, but some were even in mammal range. Um, they seem to have been warm-blooded, at least some of them, all right, with a, a, a coat of downy uh, feathers. Um, there is evidence that, you know, some could, uh, you know, move in groups, whether it be bones accumulations or um, uh, the accumulations of uh, bones or the, um, or there is even one find uh, where a big herbivore was surrounded by a couple of small dead theropods. And in this, you know, example, perhaps pack hunting uh, was, you know, suggested by those little Deinonychus predators around a big uh, ornithopod. Um, Certainly some became more and more like birds and their anatomy and a furcula, the position of uh, their hips, uh, the uh, trait of brooding over uh, eggs in a nest is known in Ovaraptor and Troodon. Um, and then the fact that uh, they not only could have downy feathers, but also flight feathers uh, means that if 
you were to look up in the, in the trees in the uh, late Mesozoic, then you would have seen feathered animals, um, but you might not have been able to distinguish. Were they early birds, which still had some dinosaur features, or were they uh, theropod dinosaurs, uh, which were very closely related uh, to birds? As I said in another video, I'll overview the evidence for the theropod ancestry of uh, birds. But suffice it to say that the distinctions between birds and dinosaurs, uh, or at least these theropods, are minimal. All right, when we look at the first birds, they still had you know, teeth, they had clawed, grasping fingers, they had long reptilian tails. And so the first birds, like Archaeopteryx, um, yes, they are birds, um, but birds are a subgroup of these theropod dinosaurs. Uh, Archaeopteryx still had uh, these uh, theropod um, uh, uh, traits. When you look at the arms, like the wings of birds are dinosaur arms. In this uh, video, uh, you'll see that uh, as once I color in the bones, uh, there are no bones in the wings of the early birds that weren't already present in the arms and hands of dinosaurs. And so now that we understand that the evidence overwhelmingly supports that the birds evolved as a subgroup of the feathered theropod dinosaurs, um, that the dinosaurs never truly became extinct. Most of them did, all right? But that um, birds are living descendants of dinosaurs. Uh, and so in that sense, perhaps then the age of dinosaurs did not end. And given that there are uh, more birds than uh, the amphibians, uh, reptiles, and mammals uh, combined in terms of number of species, uh, that you know, these dinosaur descendants are still quite successful. Once again, perhaps this age of dinosaurs has not ended. So this has just been an overview into some of the diversity of the theropod dinosaurs, which were the main terrestrial uh, predators uh, during, you know, um, uh, well over 150 million years in the Mesozoic era.